good afternoon and good evening to our chairs, speakers and wonderful audiences of the ACNS webinars. We are back again with two wonderful lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest who is an expert in the field of spine surgery, Professor Masato Tanaka from Japan. Professor Tanaka is a vice president and clinical professor at the Department of Orthopedics, Okayama Rosai Hospital, Okayama, Japan. Professor Tanaka is the counselor of the Japanese Spinal Instrumentation Society, Japanese Scoliosis Society, and Japan Society of Spine Surgery and Related Research. He is an author researcher who has published several articles in various leading journals. He is a recipient of several prestigious awards in his country, notably the Japan Spinal Instrumentation Society Award in 2001 and 2003. He was the recipient of the AO Spine Asia Pacific Regional Educator Award in the year 2017. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars and today he'll be talking about basics of scoliosis correction. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Dai Jiang. Professor Jiang is an associate professor and director of the Cerebrovascular Diseases Team, Department of Neurosurgery, Renji Hospital, Southern Campus, Shanghai Jiatong University School of Medicine, Shanghai. He was a previous visiting scholar at the Fujita Health University, Japan, and also at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, USA. He is an author author with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. We are so grateful to Professor Dai Jiang for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today, he is going to talk about endovascular management of subclavian steel syndrome. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest from Turkey, Professor Onur Yaman. Professor Yaman is associate professor at the Memorial Health Network Hospital, Istanbul, Turkey. His clinical practice is focused mainly on spine surgery. He is a member of several important organizations, including the Turkish Spine Society, Middle East Spine Society, World Spinal Column Society, Eurospine, Eospine, and SRS Scoliosis Research and Treatment Association. He has won numerous awards throughout his career for his outstanding contributions towards spine surgery. He is a noted researcher with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely thankful to him for agreeing to chair the session of Professor Masato Tanaka. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is Professor Naoya Kuyama. Professor Kuyama is the professor in the Division of Neuroendovascular Therapy Department of Neurosurgery in University of Toyama, Japan. He was a past president of the Japanese Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy. Professor Kuyama is a noted author with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely thankful to him for lending his support to our webinars on more than one occasion. And today he has agreed to chair the session of Professor Dai Jiang. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs and the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to the first chair, Professor Onur Yaman. Hello to everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee, especially Professor Kato Bin and Dr. Raja. And uh, I'm very uh, pleased to see a spinal deformity topic in a neurosurgery meeting. I hope in the future we will see more topics about it. So uh, summarizing everything in 40 minutes as the correction of the scoliosis is really, really difficult topic. But we will see what will uh, Professor Tanaka will do. If Professor Tanaka is ready, we are ready to listen in. Yes. Good evening, dear colleague. It's a great honor for me to attend this wonderful meeting. My name is Masato Tanaka from Okayama University, Japan. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you, especially Professor Yaman and Professor Kate, to invite me as an international faculty in this webinar. Today, I'd like to share our knowledge about scoliosis with you. This is the outline of my talk. First, I'll mention about what is adolescent idiopathic scoliosis like. EIS is by far the most common type of scoliosis, affecting children between ages 10 to 18. Incidence of AIS is about 3% and its pathology is still unknown. What is AIS? If 
if you look at its prognosis, increased incidence of acute and chronic pain in adults if left un untreated. Carbs more than 90 degrees are associated with cardiopulmonary dysfunction, early death, pain, and decreased self-image. For carb progression, before skeletal maturity, more than 25 degrees will continue to progress. That is why embracing is necessary. After skeletal maturity, <clears throat> more than 50 degrees, thoracic carb will progress. That is why inspection for AIS in standing position, you should check solder balance, scapular protrusion, and C7 plumb line. In a bending position, you should check rib hump and lumbar hump as well. If you see long arm and legs, you should consider Marfan syndrome. Caffeola spot means neurofibromatosis type 1. High scapular and short neck means creeper file syndrome. Circular skin bump and uh, circular lipoma means spina bifida. Least sign plus means Marfan syndrome. Joint laxity means Eras Danos syndrome. Follow up radiogram should be standing PA and lateral view like this. Before surgery, this kind of side bending and traction films are necessary to check the curb flexibility. If you look at problems of AI, According to this paper, about self-image, more than 30 degree curve angle, the self-image of the patient becomes worse. This paper suggests such a curve is worse than number one because of rib ham. Pain. According to this paper, the severe the curb is, the severe the pain is. For young patient, back pain is statistically higher than controlled, especially the area of light high thoracic area. For adult, this is a paper from Weinstein. Follow-up period is average 39 years. So back pain is higher than control group. Respiratory function. Respiratory function in age Five years old is just 30 percent, 10 years old 50 percent, and 15 years old it become uh, the same of adult. According to this famous paper, respiratory dysfunction was observed one third of the patient and average percent we see was 65 percentage. If the copper angle become a hundred degree, the lung function become half. If the copper angle become 150, it become just one third. 
this is our own patient. More than 100 degree curb. If you look at CAT scan, the vertebra compress the Bronx. Quality of life of uh, AIS patient, about 20% of the patient are suffering from mental illness. And about 50% of the patient have ADL disturbances. Long-term follow-up showed uh, patient life expectancy is also bad. If you look at this patient, the patient is dead because of heart failure. Let's move on its classification. This is an old classification of King and more classification. Nowadays, we never use this classification. Lenke classification is a golden standard. Curb types are classified into six. It includes lumbar curb and sister alignment. This classification is very comprehensive three-dimensional, and the most important point is treatment-based. Let me remind you important technical terms. End vertebra, EV, is the most suited vertebra to measure the curve angle. Neutral vertebra, NV, means the one, its horizontal rotation is zero. Stable vertebra SV indicates the most closely bisected by CSVL. Central circular vertebra vertical line. Another important concept is structural and non structural curve. Rule 1 Largest curve should be regarded as structural. Rule 2, when side bending, the curve becomes less than 25 degrees, it should be regarded as non-structure, which does not need fusion. Then get type 1, its main thoracic single curve. Type 2 is double thoracic curve. Type 3 is double major, that is thoracic and lumbar curve. Type 4 is triple major curve. Type 5 is thoracolumbar or lumbar curve. Type 6 is lumbar major and thoracic minor curve. With the radiogram, Thoracic kyphosis should be checked. Lumbar non structure curve is divided into three groups. Modifier A means CSVL is located between the pedicle of apex vertebra. Modifier B means CSVL touches the, but touches the pedicle. Modifier C means CSVL doesn't touch any part of apex vertebra. Finally, treatment strategy. First step is to choose a surgical approach. An anterior approach is indicated for single thoracic or lumbar curve. On the other hand, a posterior approach is almighty. How to decide fusion level for anterior procedure? This case is Lenke type 5, so we chose an anterior approach. 
fusion level is usually end-to-end -end vertebra. If you choose posterior approach, LIV might be L4. Advantage of an anterior approach, uh, less fusion level, more corner and rotational correction. However, disadvantage are uh, limited surgical access and steep learning curve. As you know, radiation problem is a big issue for the patient and the doctors as well. The overall cancer rate in AIS cohort study five times higher than compared with age-matched population for endometrial and breast cancer was most frequent. All stuff, so we have our spine surgeon have more than 10 times greater radiation risk. That's why we embedded CM-free technique. This CM-free technique is almost equal to navigation technique. However, it's not the same of freehand technique. And it's very similar to sugar-free diet because of good, it's very good for your health. We use this O-arm, which you think about radiation exposure seriously. Let me show you our novel CM-free technique. Every step is navigated without CM. Here is a video. First, about 15 cm oblique skin incision over 11th rib. Then cut latissim dorsi and external abdominal oblique muscle. Remove the 11th rib with a rib cutter. Next step is to open the chest. Use self-retaining retractor like this. Take CT scan by OR. Put vertebral screws under navigation guidance. Finally, Remove the discs and apply rods. This year, we already published this technique. How to decide fusion area for posterior approach? The answer is you should fuse every structure curve according to Renke classification. Next question is how to decide distal fusion level for posterior approach. LMI used to be stable vertebra, but nowadays last touching vertebra. According to their paper, the most important factor to reduce distal adding on phenomena was LIV equal last touching vertebra. L4 is stable vertebra. L2 is end vertebra. L3 is last touching vertebra. If you choose L2, that is end vertebra as LIV, the result becomes like this. Odds ratio is more than 10. Final question is how to decide upper fusion level. 
AO spine suggests this concept. If the, the shoulder balance is horizontal, you should use T3. If the right shoulder is high, then L4 or L5. If the left shoulder high, T2. This means T2 to L4 is available for upper thoracic curve correction. As you know, every rule has its exception. Let's say Renke 1C curve. Even though a lumbar curve very flexible, if the curve is relatively large, you should fuse lumbar curve as well. 15 years old female AIS, this patient underwent surgery the day before yesterday in our hospital. It looks like Benke type 3 CM, but if you look at bending, actually it was type 1 CM. For this patient, Let me show you our technique. Longitudinal incision, expose full spine, put pedicle screws under navigation guidance, like this. Neural monitoring is mandatory. Remove the spinous process, then ponte osteotomy. This is a special hemostat. Taping for translation reduction. Load insertion from concave side. Clip for the reduction. This is a direct vertebral rotation technique. And then concave side load dual in situ bending, compression, and destruction. We perform thoracic and lumbar fusion. This is one sample of Lenke breaker. Take home message for AIS. Lenke classification is a golden standard for AIS. Structural curve means Side bending more than 25, kyphosis more than 20. Anterior approach is indicated for type 1 and type 5. Posterior approach is indicated for all curves. LIV should be last touching vertebra. UIV, you should consider shoulder balance. Let's move on another topic. There are two kinds of deformity. One is corner plane deformity, mainly for young patient. The other is a sagittal plane deformity, mainly for adult patient. Adult spinal deformity is completely different from AIS. When we treat AIS patient, it's mainly for the future problems. However, the elderly patient seek for the solution for present problems, such as low back pain or guide disturbance. We all know that sagittal imbalance affects patient QOL much more than corner one. To check corner alignment, first step is to check global balance by C7 plumb line to CSVL. 
for this case, 120 mm. Second step is to check local alignment by cob angle. For this case, 45 degree. Final step is to check pelvic alignment by pelvic obliquity. This case, 18 degree. Leg length discrepancy, 3 cm. In the same manner, you should check sizal alignment. First step to check global balance by S, V, A, and global tilt. Second step is to check spinal alignment, thoracic kyphosis, and lumbar lordosis. Third step is to check pelvic alignment by PT. Final step is to check lower leg alignment, hip. Again, first step is to check the global balance. Compensated or not? This is an achondroplasia patient. As you can see, thoracic kyphosis was lost. And you can recognize lumbar hyperlordosis and periodic rotation to compensate thoracic lumbar kyphosis. Pelvic tilt, PT, is very important parameter. Diagram shows how an increase in PT contributes to the restoration of spinal sagittal alignment. PT is defined as the angle between the vertical and the line through the midpoint of the circular plate to femoral head axis. Its normal average is 15. Sum of circular slope and PT gives pelvic incidence. PI is defined as the angle between the perpendicular line from mid middle of the circular end plate to the middle axis of the femoral head. PI is unique anatomical parameter for each individual and is independent of position. PI in normal children is 47 and in normal adults 50 degrees of position. A low PI implies a low pelvic tilt, lower lumbar load losses. A greater PI needs greater LL, like this. PI minus LL is a useful parameter to measure how much correction do we need. Classification for ASD. Here is SRS classification for adult spinal deformity. Coronal curve types are divided into four categories. And there are three sagittal modifiers. The reason why they use sagittal modifiers uh, depend on this fact. ODI decrease if PI minus LL more than 11 degrees, PT more than 22 degrees, SVA 
more than 46 millimeters. For this card, type L. PI minus LL plus global alignment plus PT plus. So this is type L, PI minus LL plus, SVA plus, PD plus. Treatment strategy for ASD. This is a summary of our surgical strategy. There is no golden rule for coronal curve. You should achieve a balanced spine in the sagittal and coronal plane as well. For lumbar curve, fuse to pelvis is better. For sagittal mal alignment, according to PI minus LL, we decided correction angle. We choose three kinds of osteotomy. Ponte osteotomy, pedicle subtraction osteotomy, and vertebral column rejection. Here is a new osteotomy classification. Grade 1 is to remove partial facet joint. Grade 2 is to remove complete facet joint that is also called ponte osteotomy. Grade 3 and 4 are pedicle substruction osteotomy. PSO is a kind of closing wedge osteotomy. This is an Ankylosing sp spongilitis patient. Here is a video. Now we are removing posterior part and use osteotome. Remove the vertebra in a V shaped and then put a lot. Then cross the fossil part. This is a post operative radiogram. Grade 5 and grade 6 are vertebral club rejection. This is a congenital kyphosis patient more than 70 degree kyphosis. First, we made 3D bone model and this red area is a plan for rejection. Now we are removing the vertebral body and uh, see um, the image intensifier. Now I put the uh, uh, titanium cage and then apply the compression force and then final tightening. This is pre-op, this is post-op. This is another ankylosing spongilitis patient. First, we should expose four posterior part of the spine and then use navigation, make the entry point, use navigated probe. This is an image and then put the pedicle screw like this and then remove the whole posterior part and then continue to remove the vertebra body as well. and then close the posterior part. This is pre-op, this is post-op. One week later, he can walk like this.
we have uh, this kind of uh, patient because we are now suffering from grain of the society. This year, we published this technique of two-stage surgery. First stage, five-level anterior fusion, or if. Second stage, posterior fixation from T10 to pelvis, mainly tactinous screws. Let me show you the video. After draping, Take bone graft from uh, posterior pelvis. Take CAT scan like this. Now I'm doing registration for every instrument. This is navigated shape. Navigate the cup. Navigate the curate. Navigate the trial. And then put the cage under navigation guidance. Nowadays, we can perform only five runs. The approach is like this. Just a five centimeter skin incision. We should use this kind of special retractor. We always use navigation. And this special retractor is very useful. The very right illumination. And you can use every instrument is navigated like this. Navigated pointer. Navigated curve. Surgical field is very clear like this. The cage has its angle from 8 to 18 degrees. Now I remove the disc and then put the cage with a sear. After putting the cage, you should put screw to prevent back out. Second surgery is posterior CM free PPS with MIS cantilever. This skin incision is for PPS. This is for pelvic screw. Second surgery is CM free technique for PPS. Now we are putting percutaneous pedicle screw without CM only navigation. This is navigated high speed bar. The image is like this. SCI screw for pelvis is also navigated. This is the circumferential MIS technique, and also we can use cantilever technique as well. We did a lot of this kind of surgery. This is an 82 years old patient, failure of T12 balloon kyphoplasty. If you look at MRI, the spinal cord is a little compressed by bony fragment. We perform MRS colpectomy 
with navigation. First, we put the olive cage here and then remove the cement and vertebra and navigate it expandable cage. This is a post-operative x-ray and CAT scan. This is a final case, adult deformity case. Now you can see the several level the uh, bony fusion. We perform lateral osteotomy with navigated osteotomy. Let me show you the video. Now I am using the navigated osteotome. This is navigated corp. Not to injure the greater vessel, you should use the corp as well. And this is navigated cage. This is pre-op, post-op. We published this technique already. Take off message for ASD. New adult deformity classification and osteotomy classification are important to understand ASD. Sagittal imbalance is more important for adult spinal deformity. Treatment decision making should be based on appropriate evaluation and deep understanding of indiv individual condition. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Yaman. Raja, will we get the questions from the chat or do we get questions? You can give your expert comments as well as okay. you can invite comments as well. Professor Tanaka, it was yes. really a great lecture. Thank you Thank so you. much. And it was very difficult to summarize everything in 40 minutes. <laughs> so uh, I got some notes here and to give some message to the audiences. Uh, we have talked about the indications for adult, uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, self-imagining pain. Uh, pulmonary functions, quality of life. So most of the cases, the patients are uh, suffering from self-imagining. So now the aim of the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis uh, cases is to correct the scoliosis. But the other points are, important points are to balance the shoulders after surgery and also to decrease the rip -hump. So you have also talked about the upper instrumented vertebral levels. Can you tell us some tricks during the surgery? Uh, let's talk about Lenka type one. When you're correcting the spine, okay? Uh, let's say a right thoracic uh, curve. When you're correcting it, commonly the left shoulder is arising. So how do you correct it? How do you decide? during the surgery that you have balanced the shoulders. Do you have any tips or tricks there? Thank you. Thank you for asking a good question. So in the lecture, I also mentioned about this uh, up, uh, UIV and LIV. So LIV should be last touching vertebra. This means usually stable vertebra minus one we can save one segment because uh, instrument, uh, new instrument have a strong power to reduce correct, uh, curve correction. And UIV, upper instrumented vertebra is uh, considered shoulder balance. If the shoulder is balanced, so uh, end EV, end vertebra plus one is better. If you stop, the uh, end vertebra, the shoulder balance, uh, left shoulder will be higher than right. So if you add one, so that this one or two segment can correct upper thoracic curve. 
Is that a good, so, good answer for you? <laughs> yeah, it was a good answer. So okay. another practical way, during the surgery, if you get an AP view, an X-ray, mm -hmm. and if you see the right shoulder and left shoulder, mm -hmm. uh, if you, let's say, if the left shoulder is erased, you may compress on the left shoulder from T2 to T3. And if you distract the T2 the, and T3 at the uh, convex side, uh, you may balance all the also the shoulders. I mean, I'm, I try to uh, give this message. At the end of your surgery, you have to get an AP, an X-ray, to see if your shoulders are balanced. Let's say, this is let's say this is the convex side. This is the left side. This is the right side. If you correct the right thoracic curve, then the left shoulder will arise. So, at the end of the surgery, if you see a shoulder is imbalanced you can compress the left side. And if you distract the right side during the surgery, you will have a proper shoulder balance. Yes. And during the uh, classification of, uh, about the Lenke classification, you give us the sagittal modifiers. And maybe we have to say that if you look at the thoracic kyphosis, it also helps you to give you the maneuvers that you have to do during the surgery because most of the cases, the adolescent idiopathic cases, uh, idiopathic scoliosis cases are hypokyphotic. So uh, as you show in your uh, video in the first case, while you're uh, making a rot derotation maneuver, yes. you're getting the screws inside the thorax, you're getting it them outside. So at the end, you will have a kyphosis. So, in the classification system, if you have a kyphotic uh, scoliosis and it's uh, coming uh, hypokyphotic, so you have to use the rotation maneuver. But in some cases, you may have hyperkyphotic uh, case. Then at that surgery, you have to use translation maneuvers to reduce the kyphosis there. So these were the uh, tricks that I want to say. And do you have any uh, trick? to reduce the ripon during the surgery? Actually, I use every kind of reduction force. First, we I use load redotation maneuver and uh, translation. Usually, every cup, so convex side, usually uh, it needs translation. So another uh, reduction force is also, the vertebra is always rotated. We always use DVR, every case. And then, most important one is your inside to double rod bend, bending. And finally, adjust uh, the, the small alignment, compression, and destruction, mainly for the high, higher thoracic area. So, I always use. Every, every technique. So during scoliosis correction, we use combined techniques, but these are really good uh, keywords, keynotes. To correct the rip pump, you have to use translation and also you have to use direct vertebral rotation technique yes. as you showed in your cases. So uh, for another topic, adolescent uh, adult uh, scoliosis. Adult scoliosis, I think I don't know, what do you think are difficult than adolescent idiopathic scoliosis cases? Because the bone quality is not fine. The patient's mm -hmm. muscles are weak. So yes. the techniques that you have used, especially using uh, operating them in two stages, will decrease your uh, bleeding, will yes. uh, decrease the complication rates. So another topic in adult idiopathic scoliosis cases, when do you go to the iliac wing? When you go to the pelvis, and do you have any technique that uh, you have uh, you're using to correct the coronal balance? You have really summarized the sagittal balance. And uh, Taraka, are you a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon? Orthopedic surgeon. I'm sorry to say, orthopedic. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about <laughs> orthopedic surgeon. As the neurosurgeons, we are uh, learning the sagittal balance now. But giving the 
proper uh, tricks here. Everybody, every neurosurgeon is thinking that the sagittal balance is a, like say, an utopic thing. But to give a good message from here, every spine surgeon has to know the sagittal balance. Because uh, if you're looking to the, especially to the scoliosis cuff, you get lots of things from that. Let's say if the pelvic tilt is increased, it means the patient is using the compensatory mechanisms. Yes. Yes, and also, right. as you showed in the Schwab classification, this classification also tells us what we have to get after the surgery. It means you have to get a spine that the pelvic tilt has to be less than 20 degrees. You have to get a lumbar lordosis that is associated with pelvic incidence. They are not the things that we don't need to use. We have to use them. We know a proper lumbar lordosis according to the patient it means you have a jacket okay let's say 40 degrees lumbar lordosis jacket okay you're getting every patient look this is 40 degrees that another patient is coming you're get, getting also 40 degrees lumbar lordosis we have to decide according to pelvic incidence yes. and after the surgery the pelvic tilt has to be less than 20 degrees so that the patient doesn't need to use any compensatory mechanisms there my question is that when do you decide to fix the pelvis, the iliac thing? When do you go to the pelvis there? This is my question. To tell the truth, more than 90% of adult spine cases, adult deformity cases, I always choose pelvic anchor, especially for sacroara iliac screw. We need a strong anchor for pelvis because, as I said, in Japan, we have a lot of severe osteoporotic patients. If you stop L4, L5, it will end up the distal uh, proximal junctional, uh, distal uh, junctional kyphosis. So uh, only the relatively young patient and bone quality is good, you can stop L4 or L5. But very uh, severe osteoporotic patient, you shouldn't choose uh, the uh, LIV as a uh, uh, lower number level. It, it should be always pelvic. And it should be stronger, the strongest anchor. That means SAI nowadays. And so, as you said, PI minus LL is very important parameter. If you check the PI minus LL before, before surgery, so PI minus LL equal 10 is better. Too much correction is will end the proximal junctional kyphosis in the end. So less correction is better, not zero. Some Americans said PI minus LL should be zero, but for Japanese, I believe PI minus LL should be around 10. So it maybe we have to decide according to the age of the patient. Some new publications are coming, so uh, it will be good for a normal age, not and let's say eighty years old. You don't have to get this parameters there. And uh, Tanaka, I want to make you an invitation from this uh, platform here. Now we're writing a spinal deformity correction techniques, a book uh, from a publisher team. And if you mind, we're going to send you, I will get your email from Raja. If Raja sends your email, Definitely, I'd like you, <laughs> you're going to send you an invitation to write thank a you. chapter on it. Okay. Thank you. So that thank you will you see it. Much. Thank you so Bye. much. So thank you. Is we there any one hand uh, raised from Dr. Ajitar? One yeah. quick question, Professor Ajit, please. Yeah, it's a wonderful overview of uh, both AS and adult uh, deformity correction. I have two short questions. One is regarding the PI regarding the PILL mismatch. If there is a hypolordotic curve, you can do PSO or uh, pondis and then uh, correct increase the uh, lumbar lordosis. But if it is suppose a PI is uh, 50 and the lumbar lordosis is 70 or 75, and patient coming with a severe pain, uh, what is your choice of surgery? Second thing is regarding your navigation. How often you have uh, navigation errors? The, uh, 
But the answer for the first question is, you need to correct 10 or 20 degree. So you don't need any kind of osteotomy. Just put a cage and we always choose PPS, Parkinson's pedicle screw fixation from always P10 to pelvis, usually. Because so uh, if you stop L1, it's a uh, uh, junctional of the thoracic cage and uh, number uh, long fusion is not good. So it should be more than 10. And as I said, L5 is not a good idea for L LIV, so it should be lumbar. The answer to the second question, 100% we use navigation, 100. <laughs> right. Thank, yeah, that's good. Thank, you. Great. <laughs> thank you very much. We can conclude this session. We can hear the last uh, concluding remarks from our honorable chair, for Sir Monur Yaman. Uh, I really like to thank again the organizing committee uh, for inviting me. And uh, we want to see more spinal deformity topics in these kind of webinars. And also I'd like to thank to Tanaka, he is really a good surgeon. So uh, giving a message to neurosurgeons, every neurosurgeon has to know, has to learn and have to practice the deformity cases, but don't start with the adult cases. The best way is starting with a maybe single curve uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. The most important thing is, as Tanaka has told, to decide the fusion levels there. And uh, we have to operate that patient in time because there is no term there, adult idiopathic scoliosis cases. If you don't operate that patient, it will progress uh, very less in time. But when the patients come to 40 or 45, let's say 50 years old, these cases because of gets progressed because of this degeneration, because of the loss of the vertebral body. Now these patients come back with adult idiopathic scoliosis. So it's very difficult to operate that patient uh, at the elderly age. So we have to decide, we have to get that patients in time to have uh, with, to operate that patient with less uh, invasive surgeries. And as Tanaka has showed us, I think the future is minimal invasive surgery uh, through deformity cases. I'd like to thank everyone who has participated here, to Tanaka, to you, to, for the whole organizing committee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed a wonderful session. And thank you so much, Professor Onur Yaman, for this comment. Don't, and uh, Russia, yes. don't uh, forget to send Tanaka's email. Okay? Definitely, I will send you. <laughs> May I kindly you. request if <laughs> Professor Tanaka and Professor Yaman will be staying back for the second lecture, or would you be leaving? If you don't mind, I want to leave. I'm on vacation. Okay, thank you so it's much. It's okay, enjoy. enjoy I, will, I, will, I will be back whenever you want, okay? Thank you very much. You're so welcome. We'll go on to the second session, for which may I invite Professor Kuwayama to say introduction part. Professor Kuyama, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Raja. So uh, I'm very happy to introduce you, uh, the uh, second uh, distinguished speaker of Professor John Dai. Uh, he's the Associate Professor of the uh, Department of Neurosurgery, uh, Renji Hospital, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, China. Uh, tonight, he will talk about endovascular management of subclavian steel syndrome. I think it's very important for us neurosurgeons to treat cervical carotid and cervical vertebral and subclavian arteries by neurosurgeons, by ourselves, not by vascular surgeons or cardiologists. Because these arteries are the source of cerebral blood flow, and the uh, disease of these arteries is a cause of stroke. So uh, in that sense, I believe his talk today is very important for us neurosurgeons. So let's start the lesson. Professor John Dai, please. Yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening, I'm John Dai from the Hospital, Shanghai, China. Today, my topic is endovascular treatment of subclavian steel syndrome. 
So the Cleveland artery disease is an under-recognized manifestation of periphery vascular disease present in approximate 2% of the general population. It is associated with smoking, hypertension, depressed levels of high density lipoprotein and lower extremity peripheral artery disease. Subclavian artery disease is caused by most frequently is the atherosclerosis. The left side is more likely to be affected than the right side. Subclavian artery disease is typically found in the first segment of the subclavian artery from the ostium to the vertebral artery takeoff. The symptoms of subclavian disease include arm or decaying and vertebral basilar insufficiency. However, the major rate of patients with angiographic evidence of subclavian steel syndrome are clinically uh, symptomatic. Subclavian steel syndrome occurs in patients with proximal subclavian artery or Innominate artery disease with retrograde flow in the vertebral artery to compensate for increased de demand of the upper extremity. Rarely, subclavian artery disease may present as coronary steel in patients that have undergone left internal memory artery bypass to the left anterior density artery. Initial assessment of patients with subclavian artery disease includes blood pressure, can measure the uh, uh, systolic calf pressure difference of more than 10 mmH is considered to be significant. The presence of brutus and uh, less frequent uh, physical findings include finger ankle necrosis and so on. This figure shows us the mechanism of the clinical manifestation of the subclavian artery diseases. I issued uh, the retrograde flow from ipsilateral vertebral artery towards to the branchial artery during the upper extremity exercises may compromise the posterior circulation. This can result in vertebral basilar insufficiency. The B showed us that reduced blood flow to the branchial artery may lead to intermittent claudication of the upper extremity. It may also compromise upper extremity dialysis, graft, and fistulas. The C issue is that in patients who have undergone coronary artery bypass graft surgery, using the internal memory artery, subclavian disease may manifest as myocardial ischemia. The D shows us patients with periaxillofemoral bypass may present with intermittent claudication of the lower extremity. The imaging examination for the SSS include Doppler, CTA, DSA, and MRA. The treatment indication include the sympathetic patients with arm claudication, cerebral hypoperfusion, and subclavian steel syndrome. The other indication is the protection of dialysis fistula and bypass grafts. 
In the absence of symptoms, patients should be treated with antiplatelet agents, high dose statins, and antihypertensive agents. The surgical treatment for the subclavian artery disease include bypass surgery. We can connect in the carotid to subclavian or carotid to axillary or axillary to axillary arteries with PTFE or dichron grafts. The other surgery treatment is transpositions. We can do the that uh, subclavian artery ligation or an reanastomosis to the common carotid artery. Now the endovascular treatment is as the first line therapy for the subclavian artery disease. Now involved from balloon angioplasty to the standing, because the standing can avoid recoil and restenosis. The success rate of the endovascular treatment was about 95%. The combined risk of stroke and death was about 3%. The primary and the secondary potency rate at 10 years are about 80%. There are three approach for the endovascular treatment. The femoral approach is the most common and used approach. The radio and branchial approach is best reserved if femoral access is difficult due to torticity, stenosis, anatomy, or larger disease bending. The combined approach knows, was known as the body flows technique or the poor slew technique. It is useful in difficult aortic anatomy. It involves uh, advances from the radial and the branchial side to the distal aorta, which is then snared from the femoral artery. A sheath can then be passed from the femoral artery over the wire into the subclavian artery. This picture is a schedule map of the combined approach. A to show that a guide wire is inserted through the upper extremity and advanced to the distal AOT and then snared from the femoral artery, forming a continuous pathway from the uh, upper extremity to the lower extremity. B should as a larger ball catheter is then inserted through the femoral artery proximal to the leaving in the subclavian artery. And C should us that after balloon predilation, a stent is placed by the femoral approach in the subclavian artery. Complete occlusion is three times more previous valence in the left side than the right side. The primary challenge with treating chronic occlusive disease is visualization of distal vessels as well as achieving cerebral protection. In such cases, radial or branchial access may be a better alternative to conventional femoral access. A combined approach with two guide wires from the radio and femoral access along with a double injection on either side of the lesion allows better 
visualization and test test the manipulation to overcome chronic occlusions. There are three kinds of stent can be used in the endovascular treatment of the subclavian artery disease. Balloon expandable stents can provide a greater radio force and are preferred in rigid calcified lesion where deployed deployment precision is vital. Over aggressive deployment of balloon expandable stents may result in perforation of the artery and uh, intrathoracic hemorrhage. To avoid over expansion of bare metal stents, a stent size one to two millimeters smaller than the artery is preferred. The self-expanding stents may be used in nodal style, style long and middle segment lesion. These stents have a high rate of stent compression and restenosis. A stent one to two millimeter larger than the, the artery is preferred. The PTFE covered stand can provide a barrier to prevent internal hyperplasia. The complications of endovascular treatment include inadequate expansion, increases positioning of the stent, the stent fatigue, and the stent fracture, and uh, some can have the cerebral vascular complications. Now I will show three cases here. Case one, female, 65 years old. She complained the recurrence dizziness for several months. Seven years ago, the left ICA aneurysm was calling successfully. The DSA shows the left ICA aneurysm was calling good. And uh, this picture shows the occlusion at the first segment of the left subclavian artery. And uh, this video shows the steel flow from the right vertebral artery to the left uh, vertebral artery, then to the branchial artery. This patient, uh, we use the combined approach. We first uh, form the radio approach. This is, we can see the test from the radio artery. And then we use the micro wire, three millimeter lens, uh, zero point zero eighteen inch, this micro wire can slow the lesion. You can see slow the lesion. And then we form the femoral artery approach. This is eight French guiding hazard with the loop. We can use the loop, slid the micro wire into the eight French guiding hazard. This is our uh, self-made the loop. Then we can form a continuous pathway pathway from the left upper extremity to the right lower extremity. Then we use the balloon. This is the balloon to the lesion from the femoral artery. And then the balloon expandable Stay stent. 
advanced to the region and uh, expand uh, the stand. This is the uh, final angiography. We can see the left uh, vertebral artery is a uh, follow. The flow is forward and uh, from the right vertebral artery angiography, the steel flow disappeared. About two years later, follow up a DSA. Also, the result is good. Case two, male, 64 years old. He complained the recurrence dizziness and left upper limb weakness for one year. The blood pressure is diff uh, significant difference between the left uh, and uh, the right uh, upper extremity. The DSH issue also shows the uh, occlusion uh, is at uh, the first segment of the left uh, subclavian artery. Yeah. Here we also can see the steel flow from the right vertebral artery. First, uh, we use the femoral approach. This is the five, uh, eight French guiding cathode, then the four French cathode in the Eight French cassette here. We try through the lesion again and again. But at last, we found the, the artery dissecting. Here, we can see the, the this is the dissecting artery. Then we perform the radio artery approach here to find uh, the true artery lumen. We approach, this is, can see, we across the lesion from the radio artery. Here, we use a small balloon dilation at the lesion from the radio artery. Here, after the dilation. This can help us uh, cross the lesion from the femoral approach. Then we cross the lesion from the femoral artery and uh, use a larger uh, balloon dilation. Yeah. This is after dilation. And then we use the first uh, balloon expandable stent at the distal for the dissecting. And uh, the second stent, also the balloon expandable stent for the leading. Here is the final angiography. Show the forward flow in the left vertebral artery here.
three months follow up uh, DAC also show a good results. Case three, female, 78 eight years old. She complained intermittent dizziness, nausea and vomiting for about 20 days. Blood pressure also significant difference between the left and the right upper extremity. The DSC shows, uh, shows that uh, uh, serial stenosis at the first segment of the left subclavian artery. And we cannot see the left vertebral artery. And we also find the steel flow from the right vertebral artery. This patient also have the left ICA aneurysm. So because this is, I think this is a simple, simple case. So we use the femoral approach here. We use the eight front guiding at the proximal to the lesion. And across the lesion, this is the micro cathode to confirm the true lumen and then we use a bloom pre-dilation here after pre-dilation here and then use a SD and then the this is the final final angiography. We can see the left vertebral artery appeared and the forward flow in it and the steel flow disappeared from the right vertebral artery. We also uh, use a standard assisted coding for the left ICA aneurysm. This is the final angiography. Coding is good. Our experience is for the endovascular treatment for the of the subclavian artery disease. The, the first is fishing polo technique. This can uh, give us the supporting supporting power to across the lesion. And uh, the second is the true vascular booming must be confirmed. The combined approach is useful in difficult case. Predilation by small balloon, and we prefer to use the balloon expandable stent. So the last conclusion, subclavian artery disease is an under-recognized condition that has a wide range of clinical presentations. Patients can be used for uh, patient can be successfully treated with modern endovascular techniques. Patients with refractory disease and instant restenosis of bare metal stents can be successfully treated with balloon expandable covered stents with good middle team follow up. Patients with refractory disease, despite endovascular measures, may require surgery. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor John Dai, for your uh, nice uh, educational lecture. And uh, you finally uh, showed us three cases, right? 
Yeah. Uh, the first case is uh, uh, with the uh, lesion of near occlusion. And uh, you did uh, uh, brachial approach, brachial approach. And the second, uh, second case is uh, chronic total occlusion. And you did this at first uh, transfemoral approach, but uh, after uh, having a complication of dissection, vessel dissection, you switched it into the uh, uh, transbrachial approach and made it successfully. And the uh, third case is uh, a simple stenosis, which was treated by a transfemoral approach. Um, these are very illustrative cases. And uh, if there are any questions from the audience or can I have some questions to I, you? I think there is one question which is live mm -hmm. from the audience. Yes. The anti-grade and retrograde combined axis is very useful when single approach fails. There are two questions. First, in the cases, did you do a pre-dilatation in the occluded subclavian artery? If yes, did you worry the pre-dilatation causes embolic debris? Second, have you seen any complications in your cases after endovascular treatment? Oh, yes. Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, I always use uh, balloon, balloon uh, pre dilation in these all the cases. Uh, the pre dilation, and I will use a small balloon. Sometimes we use about uh, four to five millimeter millimeter diamond balloon and uh, the balloon uh, when expanding uh, slowly and slowly. So uh, I think uh, uh, no uh, can see the extreme complication in our in my cases. Right, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, the issue of this uh, question is to use or not the uh, protective balloon in the uh, vertebral artery, uh, Professor John Dai. Uh, yeah, he is asking you uh, uh, if you use, whether you use protective balloon in the vertebral artery during the procedure to uh, protect from the uh, embolic stroke uh, to the uh, vertebral basal uh, artery. Okay. I you not use it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, we not use the uh, protect balloon uh, to protect uh, the vertebral artery. Uh, I think may because uh, sometimes I, um, from my opinion, uh, the steel, the steel flow from the right uh, vertebral artery to the left uh, vertebral artery to the then to the um, branchial artery, sometimes the flow can protect uh, the Embolium, emboli, uh, angel to the vertebral artery, I think. So uh, there was some reports uh, to say that the uh, uh, reversed flow in the vertebral artery, I mean, uh, uh, still phenomenon is still lasting even after the dilatation of the subclavian artery for several minutes. This is the yes, reason right. that why they do not use any protective balloon in the vertebral artery. And uh, my answer is also, yes, we do not use any uh, protective balloon in the vertebral artery uh, because we know the uh, reverse flow is lasting for several minutes. So the uh, embolic shower will uh, occur in the distal <laughs> distal arm vessel, not in the vertebral basal artery. 
This is my opinion. And uh, in the second case, uh, you showed me, you showed us, uh, is there a, a vertebral artery occlusion immediately after the procedure? It's a, a dissection, uh, the occlusion from the dissection? Uh, no, no, I just uh, find uh, the dissecting at the distal of the lesion. Uh, because in the procedure, we did not uh, angel, um, do the angiography to in the right vertebral artery. So we don't know the ostium of the left vertebral artery uh, is accrued. But uh, at the final, after at the final angiography, after our treatment, uh, the left uh, uh, vertebral artery uh, should be good. Okay, so I think uh, if the patient have a stenosis in the subclavian artery, uh, we uh, the approach will be easy. But uh, when you see the chronic total occlusion (CTO). Uh, it's very difficult to pass the wire through the uh, occlu occlu occlusive part. Do you have any, uh, uh, some uh, good idea to uh, get through the wire through it? Uh, which approach uh, is better for CTO, from brachial or from femoral? Uh, to my opinion, I think uh, uh, it is better uh, to select uh, the bronchial or radial artery approach. Mm -hmm. uh, we can easy to across the lesion, the occlusion across the lesion. It is very easy. Uh, in our in our center, we do the occlusion subclavian. Okay, I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, sometimes mm. I, so in our uh, center, we use the uh, fishing polo technique. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It can, uh, yeah, it can uh, give us the good supporting, supporting power to yeah. uh, do the- Through, through wire the, technique. Yeah. yeah. But uh, when you have a CTO, uh, which side do, uh, do you prefer to approach, uh, from brachial wire insertion or from femoral wire insertion mm -hmm. for chronic total occlusion? I think uh, I think uh, the brachial approach is easier to uh, get through the wire. Uh, I think uh, uh, from the femoral approach, we can use the larger larger time uh, diameter device, but mm -hmm. uh, for the lesion, I prefer the radio or the, or the uh, bronchial artery approach. So I think a combined approach is the best uh, for these patients. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, one more question. Uh, you mentioned uh, about the uh, PTFE uh, covered stent. Is there a kind of uh, uh, stent available in China? I've no, no, I <laughs> never see this. I've never uh, seen this stent. This is a new stent. Uh, not, uh, I think, uh, not uh, admit uh, admit uh, can use it in China. Okay. Is, is there any drug eluting stent? In, in for this uh, subclavian artery, like uh, coronary uh, artery. No, no, uh, not yet. Yeah, drug, uh, drug cover. You mean drug cover uh, mm. balloon or the drug cover stent? Now in China, uh, we try. It is only at the trying stage. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, John Dai. So, is there any question uh, from the audience? Raja, Liu, do we have any like to ask something, Dr. Liu Boon? Hmm? You are muted, Liu. We can't hear you. Okay. I, I don't have any question. Okay, right. Okay, okay Liu, <laughs> go ahead. We, he doesn't have any question. We can hear your concluding remarks, Professor Kuyama. We can wind up. Please give your concluding remarks, Professor Kuyama. Uh huh. Okay. So uh, today we have a, a very uh, educational lecture from uh, Professor John Dai. He talked about the uh, anatomic feature and uh, uh, indication and the technique of the uh, subclavian artery dilatation stenting. Thank you very much for your uh, outstanding lecture. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. It was indeed a very informative session. So I'll wind this up officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yokosukat. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Masato Tanaka and Professor Jiong Dai, as well as the chairs, Professor Onu Yaman and Professor Naoya Kuayama for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to thank my co-host for today, Dr. Jibun Singh. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for supporting us and suggesting Professor Jiang Dai as a speaker and helping us to reach out to a larger audience in China by arranging the WeChat broadcast. Today, there are around 630 audiences who are watching us live on various streaming platforms. So until we all meet on the 18th of August, it is bye-bye from everybody. Thank you very much for joining.